Welcome to the Under the Hat Podcast, the show where we talk about everything and anything that is top of mind in education. The goal is to provide meaningful conversation to what is currently happening in our classrooms, stories, pains, moments of success. We want to hear it all. Friends, and we are going to hear it all tonight, and I'm not even going to bother with the usual like intro stuff. I'll talk about under the hat logistics at the end. I want to dive right into this conversation because we are joined tonight by my good friend, Renee Dawson. She is amazing. She is a ball of energy that is really keen to have us learn tonight. So without further ado, Renee, how are you? I'm awesome. How are you? Thank you for having me. I'm great. I'm great. I'm super excited for this conversation and where we go with things. And so I know I, I, I see you on the social medias. I see you in this ed tech space, in this leadership space. And so I know you quite well, just like seeing all the amazing work that you're doing. And I think you have some tea for us tonight, which I'm excited to hear about. Um, but for those that are listening and maybe don't know you, have not started following you, who are you, your context, and, and, and kind of the work that you've done thus far? I'm Renee Dawson. I am an ed tech specialist in Atlanta, Georgia. Prior to that role, I taught special education for 15 years, if you can believe it, <laughs> um, in every type of setting from co-teaching to resource. I even did itinerant, which is travel teaching to different schools. And I've done, hmm. I've worked with every disability category from recently released juvenile delinquents to autism to physical and health disabilities, which is where I spent most of my career and ass assistive technology primarily and every grade level. So <laughs> I've done so much in my career that um, I decided with my passion for technology that it was time to move into the ed tech space. And in my school, I actually fill a couple roles. I am the ed tech specialist, but I also am the Verizon Innovative Learning Schools coach, which if you're not familiar with the Bills program is an amazing program that I'll tell you a little bit about. And I coach the esports team, student tech team, Minecraft student ambassadors and Minecraft competitive tech team. Wow, you are you are wearing all the hats. All like, the tech that is <laughs> Yeah, that is that's amazing. That is amazing. Um and so I I, I know that this episode you know, was kind of branded and labeled as like esports, and I for sure want to hear about that. Um, but uh, you have some like kind of fairly new ventures, right? Some some I new do. opportunities. Yeah. I so I, I I'm for my own sake, I'm curious and and, and very um, interested in kind of hearing what has happened as of late. Definitely. I mean, like you said, I brought the tea. Grab your herbal tea because I got the verbal tea. So. <laughs> <laughs> First and foremost, I just stepped into a new side hustle role as Almanac AI's community manager. And if you're not familiar with Almanac AI, they're a relatively new, new AI tool for educators. And I love it because you can do everything on their platform from personalize an entire course that you can then fill with their AI resources to just building out a lesson with resources. So you can go big, you can go small. And then most recently, they just dropped AI report card comments, which I don't know if you in the classroom hated that job, but that was always like one of the hardest things for me to do was sit down and write report card comments for every single student I had in like different categories. So you can use their platform and AI to help you draft report card comments for your students. Okay. So I'm sorry. I'm trying to wrap my head around yeah. what, what this does, right? So like when you said report card comments and when you pointed out that that pain, and I'll be yeah. honest, that pain. That pain. Um, I remember having to, so I, I had to do that in uh, in power school, right? So like my mm -hmm. district, SIS was power school, and we had to we had to dump all those comments. And I remember it was a lot of the same, sometimes the same verbiage, or like it was the same, but I had to make it really personalized for this one particular student in family, which that was fine, but that does take a lot of time, right? Like that's like yes. like. It's like another layer to the grading that I didn't realize until like right now. I was like, even though right. I did it. So is it, is it something that is like banked or is it speaking to so other software? Like how does that, how does that work? So it doesn't speak to other software. You can copy and paste in the other software right now. Okay. They're, they're working on getting it, you know, 
you know, more fluid with other platforms, but you can either, you can use a prompt to draft like a generic one that you can then tailor for your students, or you can use the prompt to make it more specific, just depending on how detailed your prompt is, as always with AI, how detailed you want to get with your prompt. And then you can tailor it based on that. So what I was showing my teachers the other day was make your base comment that you're going to give to most students and then copy and paste it into like a Google Doc and then add, like tailor it from there so that you can easily like then share it into Infinite Campus or school, Power School or wherever you're sharing your comments. Yeah, yeah. And my, my, my friend Sophie is in the chat here and she kind of had the comment of remember placing comment comment codes. Codes. Oh, that takes me way back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And 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 because some of this, like some of this is like no, not some of it, but like there, there's there's a component to this that's like important with the law, right? Like making sure that we're documenting the right things for students to make sure that we are providing the supports that that those that certain students need that those students need um so yeah that that is huge in terms of solving a real need and solving a real problem you did mention though that there is a lesson planning component right there's a so, lesson planning component and a unit planning like a course planning component so you could plan a whole semester with their tool and then based on that it gives you like a couple different options even like it gives you a basic lesson plan model option or even the 5e model which is great because we use 5e a lot at my school and you can plan based on the 5e's and it gives you suggestions, YouTube video suggestions, slide prompt suggestions, stuff like that. You can pull their resource, their AI generative resources in. They have different resource generators into the unit plan per lesson. Or you could just do like one simple lesson if you wanted to. But our district is personalized learning. So we try to show our mm -hmm. teachers how to personalize everything for every student or at least groups of students. And so that right. the tool really spoke to me on that level of planning like a whole course in a personalized nature. And uh, I really love that feature um, because there's so often the box curriculums just fall short of what you really need to like reach everybody in your classroom. So if you can start from something like that and then generate more detailed and personalized content, I think that's the way that we have to head in education to really close this gap that we're seeing that's just getting bigger and bigger. Preach because that was so uh my district and no shade if you're listening from from my previous district no shade at, at, at all but like you know our, our district purchased new uh social studies curriculum right um I won't mention the company right like again it's it's not it's it's not that I'm just I'm just saying that like we get this curriculum like one size fits all right and it's not flexible and then sometimes it turns into teachers being like and i was low-key one of them were like cool i'm not going to use this and then that's a different problem right in terms of investment right. like you you like the district spends however much money on this curriculum and then it doesn't get used and maybe it only gets used by like a quarter maybe half of the teachers and that's a problem too and largely it's because of what you mentioned like there's no personalization right. it's not flexible sometimes when it's completely web-based then you're locked into like living in one platform which might be good on one hand but on the other like how are you remixing how are you like customizing and and so differentiating reaching everyone correct yeah so with with this uh with this new venture of yours like what this tool does is it is it able to pull from online curriculum like that like, um, or no, you pretty it much, it depends on how detailed your prompt is. Uh, you know, again, we always talk about prompts and, and writing them, but the more, obviously the more detailed you put your standard in there that you'll get, you know, the more detailed content and it kind of builds out the base lesson plan and then lets you add the resources, um, that it generates. So you can kind of pick and choose what you want to add, which gives you even more choice on what's going on, you know, in your curriculum. And from a special ed teacher standpoint, I rarely got a set of the box curriculum because it wasn't appropriate for my class or that wasn't purchased or whatever this situation was, you know, no shade to any of my districts because we all know how expensive those things are. And I always had to share. Right. So having something like this to just as a backup or just to really like make everything more robust is, is so nice right now in education. Um, and one of the things I, I like is that, you know, with every new platform, there's going to be bugs and there's things that don't always work right, right away. Well, in our Facebook group, there's a form that you can fill out that just takes it straight to our developers to tell them what's going on on the site that's buggy, what's not working right, what is frustrating people, so that 
they you can report your issues right away to us and somebody can jump on it that day like real time and that i just have to underscore this that is a sign that that's a company that belongs in the space of education yes. um and so uh, that is amazing because i i can say the same thing about my company um of like they they have an ear right they have an they ear, have an they ear on, on, they've on the ground at to on top like like they're like they they want that feedback to improve the ultimate goal and that's to like support and show greater student outcome right for all right. for all students and, and so that's amazing that they're that they're being diligent and purposeful with getting that feedback uh from people that are using their platform from teachers administrators what what have you um that that is awesome and so i would also imagine because we're it's ai it doesn't matter where in the country or in the world that you're teaching, because if it's yeah. AI, like whatever standard it is, whether it's state standard science, like whatever it is, uh, it'll just take that and run with it. I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. And even if you're, and I really see this being beneficial for the homeschool world because you have, you know, parents that struggle with homeschooling that want to homeschool for reasons that are valid and that might not have the background to, you know, feel like they're really prepared to homeschool. And those that's really expensive to homeschool. If you don't have like a cyber academy that teams up with your state or something like that, where you're getting the resources. So this is really beneficial to that homeschool community that looks for ways to really, re to really reach their students on that individualized level that they're homeschooling for. Cause if you're homeschooling, you're obviously doing that to individualize stuff for your child and personalize it. So this is great for um, anyone in the homeschool space, tutors, parents looking for help for their children. Um, it's a great um, tool for anybody like that. Yeah, I, I also, now that you mentioned that, I kind of, I'm going to look into this a little bit more because now I'm teaching and working in a credential program. I almost think this is a good way for our credentialing students to like play with, to even like inspiration is like, hey, some of these kids they've never and you know they're not just kids but like people that are want to be teachers they they they've never built out a lesson plan right and 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 sometimes the yeah, ad doing is 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 how you learn but having like examples um and and kind of using the ai in that way as the engineer so mm -hmm. to speak i can see how that's beneficial in that context so yeah that's that's definitely something worth looking into um, you just took me like back to writing my first unit when I was an undergrad and I forgot to do it. <laughs> so oh, I put an yeah. all-nighter in the library, when made my two best friends stay with me all night and watch me write this 10-day unit. And then they hated me because I got the highest grade in the class. <laughs> and the teacher was like, I can tell she took the entire semester to really build this out. And I was like, no, nah. it was like eight hours. <laughs> Hey, you know, when you got it, you got it. Like, and that's, that's how that goes sometimes. Right. Um, <laughs> Definitely didn't help my procrastination issues. I was struggling with in college. Um, but <laughs> it worked out for me. I, they still right. throw shade at me for it too. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. That's great. Um, so uh, I know Renee, like you have, you have more tea. Um, I, I kind of want to spread this out over the course of the hour. Okay. Like, yeah. Uh, you know, share that love. Um, I would really like to get into this topic of esports because that, yes. that sounds like an area that you thrive in, that you've done. Like from my, my understanding, you've built a program. My own district, uh, they rolled out like district wide program. Like I think they're in their second year. Um, I've I have lots of questions, but okay. um, because that's nothing like that's something that I didn't really uh have the opportunity to really dive into when I was still in the high school classroom. So curious to hear your context, how you got started with it, and like what what outcomes, what benefits you saw as okay. a result of, of esports? Yeah, so the most important thing I always tell everybody when I present on esports or even have a conversation is I'm not a gamer. I haven't gamed since like Mortal Kombat was on Sega um, and like Super Mario Brothers was on Super Nintendo. Like a Duck Hunt was like my jam. So that's how far back I go with gaming experience. All of that is cool anymore. though. All of that is cool. Don't tell <laughs> right. you that. Those were, those were clutch those were like... Games. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had the running game too, where you could like run as fast as you could on the running pad, and your character was just like doo doo, doo doo, like on the <laughs> screen, just going and you're just breaking a sweat, going like just hard. Oh, yeah. 
very slowly. But um, so I don't really have and maybe Guitar Hero. I think I played that like after college with my mom, like on Saturday nights. Um, because I lived with her. But um, I'm not a gamer, and I run a very successful program. So I always tell people the most important thing is you do not have to be a gamer to do this. You just have to have the desire to make a difference with kids on this level. Mm. And that's all it takes. Because my kids are responsible for everything in that room. They are responsible for setting up every piece of equipment, maintaining it, making sure that nothing gets scratched or damaged, putting it all back away, locking the cabinet, bringing me the keys back. They do it all. I just make sure nobody gets in a fist fight or swears. Fair. Okay. And then they clean up after themselves. We have rules right. and if they don't follow the rules, they're gone because <laughs> that's how rules work. But they're very, right. you know, they, it's something they want to do. So they're more likely to follow the rules, obviously. But yeah. we've seen we've seen some really cool things. So the program started last spring through a pilot program in our district where they, uh, the district was gracious enough to fund uh, pilot programs for all the elementary and middle schools because in Georgia, um, esports is a high school sanctioned sport. So there's funding for it in high school. Hmm. Okay. And I don't know if you knew this, but over 50 HBCUs have esports teams. So there's also scholarships coming down the HBCU pipeline, which is really strong in Atlanta because of Atlanta University Center. Um, so we wanted to strengthen that scholarship potential for our students. Right. And so is this all is this all extracurricular? Like, is this happening in classrooms or is it like after school kind of thing? Both. We do. We have a couple of different models that we run at our school. So we started after school last year and it was practice one day a week and then inter squad matches another day a week. And we run our program through a company called Elite Gaming Live. And to plug them real quick, we love them because we were able to tie in a STEM component with them. They have... Um, a platform that the students have access to, which give them modules on gaming careers that are STEM based that they can complete during the season for extra live score points. And your live score points are what gets you to the championship. You get points for playing in inner squad matches and for completing modules on Elite Gaming Live. And um, the district really liked the tie into STEM and the tie into college and career um readiness with the platform so that's kind of why we stuck with that company and piloted with them and they're a console based um gaming company so we run uh a ps5 an xbox tower and two nintendo switches um the xbox mm -hmm. game we play is rocket league we play smash bros and mario kart on switch and then uh, we rotate sport games every season from fifa to madden to nba 2k those are all really cool games. Like, like right. if I was a kid right now, I'd be like, wait, why aren't we doing this right now? Um, right. And, and so just, I just want to make sure I'm getting this right. So, yep. so what I dropped in here, that's the right one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Yeah, awesome. definitely hit them up. If you're looking to start um, their customer success manager, Sterling is happy to chat esports. Even if you don't go with them, we just did a presentation at a conference yesterday. That was great. Um, and he's just amazing. The whole company's amazing. It was started, you know, just to really spread awareness about gaming careers. Cause you know, my kids think that they could be a streamer or a tester and that's it, but there's over a hundred careers in a gaming company from everything from nutrition to legal, to education, to somebody who writes the story, to somebody who programs the colors. So just knowing mm -hmm. that there's that robust ability to get into a career that really excites you and involves gaming is really huge for our kids and they get to learn about it on the platform. And then our top five players with the highest live scores go to our big district championship at the end of the year to win like cash prizes. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. I, so I, I, I was into gamification in the classroom. So I was using things like Gim kit. Mm -hmm. um, there's another one, Sophie, Sophie and I both use a, another one, Sophie, but I'm, I'm forgetting the, the name of this particular one. Um, it was like really immersive. But it was all very, you know, content and I guess standard driven, right? So my question that I've always had in my head about, because this is different, like this is straight mm -hmm. up like they're gaming, um, is any part of this, because you did mention that some of this is happening in the classroom, yep. uh, is any part of this like is curriculum infused into this at all? 
So like I said, the STEM curriculum is infused on that platform, but okay. the pieces that we pull that are in the classroom um, are a little different. So I'm also Minecraft. I'm also a Minecraft education ambassador. So we have Minecraft student ambassadors, mm. oh, which um, we're a Minecraft district. So we do Minecraft for education, which they you know um, have education platform, uh, an education platform with lessons and worlds that are tied directly into education. Everything from like elementary um, topics to a periodic table that's interactive to an amazing lesson that I have to brag about my uh, district for writing, what district peeps for writing on Good Trouble, where you get to walk like over the Selma Bridge with John Lewis and other civil rights characters and and interact with them in the world. They they wrote that world mm -hmm. and curriculum for Minecraft, um, and that's all you know free for Microsoft districts. So getting that going is is was helpful. I started with that first when I started at the school was getting Minecraft into the classrooms and I have student ambassadors who the teachers can kind of borrow and the student ambassador goes in and helps teach the Minecraft curriculum with the teacher. So the teacher does the actual curriculum pieces. And then my Minecraft student ambassador works with the students on and the teacher on making sure the world is loaded and everybody knows how to play and that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing in the Minecraft world. Um, so it gives them that leadership ability and opportunity, and then they still get to play Minecraft in class. So what's better than that? Yeah, um, what's, the, what's the problem? <laughs> <laughs> and um, I got certified in Fortnite for education last year through I2E. And so I'm certified to do Fortnite creative in the classroom, which sends me straight to middle school heaven. Um, <laughs> because <Right? laughs> now we have gaming desktops in our Verizon Innovation Lab that have um, the Epic Games server on it. And we do Fortnite for education in creative mode. And they can build the kind of the same way they do in Minecraft, uh, where they have there's lessons that are available for Fortnite for education. And they can build in creative mode. There's even a really cool sound platform that they can build their own beats in Fortnite. So they can do that with like a, you know, for music or for connections, tie-ins. So those are the two we mainly infuse in the classroom. But with the esports, like console based games, I had this idea in October. I was kind of thinking, like, all this stuff sits in my classroom all day long and nobody uses it. Like, what? What would happen? Like, just out of curiosity, if I took it out at lunch and let kids come down and play at lunch because they have 30 minutes. So, like, if I came up with a system and let some kids, or maybe even some of our kids that we were struggling with attendance and behavior, like, specifically, pulled them because we were talking in an admin meeting, like our behavior, our suspension rate was going up and we didn't know what to do. And our attendance was going down. And it was like, how do we get the kids here? Because if we have them in the building by like pure osmosis, they're just going to soak something up, <laughs> like, right. like something. <laughs> so get them in the building, get them and keep them in class and something's going to happen. So I worked with the social worker and my, we have um, a partner uh, communities and schools that works with our at-risk students. And so I worked with my social worker and our communities and school representative to come up with a list of students to just kind of ask if they would be interested. And I bought them those little plastic wristbands that all the kids wear. Um, you know, the ones that started as like live strong wristbands, but now like they're, everybody has like their own little plastic wristband and they, it acts as a fast pass to get them through the line first at lunch. And then they come down to my room with their lunch. Sixth grade sets up all the equipment. Seventh grade does a spot check. Eighth grade puts away all the equipment. They have 15 minutes to game. They usually want to play either Madden or NBA 2K. So we run a bracket that I made on Fig Jam. And um, they maintain their bracket. They have to maintain the bracket after we do the random selection to see who's going head to head for the first round. And um, I start a timer. When the timer goes off, they clean up their lunch and go back to class. And I just wanted to see what would happen data wise. Well, <laughs> our suspensions dropped 27% of in one month, just of those kids that I targeted and their wow. attendance increased by 21% in a month. You, so, you know, do, doing this podcast, like I, I kind of have like a flow in my head. So yeah. I'm going kind of, I'm, I'm to unpack my hat for a second. Uh, Cause like, you know, I'm, I'm obviously listening intently and like, but in the process, I'm like, Ooh, I have a question. Yeah, yeah, a question. yeah. You, you, the question I was going to ask you, Next, you literally just answered it. Um, and because my question was going to be, Renee, what, uh, you know, what were the student outcomes that you saw? And perhaps like what data did you did you were you able to gather to mm -hmm. show like the effect size of this? But 
you, you just did that. That's, that's, that's amazing, yeah. especially for the students that don't feel heard, don't right. feel seen that like good, bad, or otherwise there's a system here, at least in our country of like, you know, if you're an athlete, you, you are, you are in a certain light, right? If you are mm -hmm. a gate student, you are in a certain light, right? And like, so like oftentimes these students that do have these passions, that do have this voice, they, they, have, they, have, they have something to say, but oftentimes they feel like they're not into the right thing or a part of the right group to do so. Um, and to me, I think like what you've done here helps at least partially address that, that issue, right? Like, like we're, 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 we're making our education system, at least in your context, more inclusive in that way. Right. Yeah, I yeah. accidentally fixed a big problem. <laughs> That's what I always say. Like it was, I just, like, I accidentally fixed it. But, um, you know, the, a lot of the students that want to participate in esports, you know, we have to have rules because it's a sanctioned sport. So a lot of the rules are like you'd be passing your classes and you have to have good behavior and they might not qualify yeah. to be on the team. But if I can at least give them that break during lunch to be a kid, because we don't have recess in middle school anymore. And I'm six through eight. So we don't have mm. that 20 minutes of recess where they get to just chill and be a kid. It's just constant class, class, class. And it's exhausting. Yeah. So just giving them that 20 minutes to just be with their friends and goof off and have fun is huge for them. And, you know, even the ones that are still struggling in class and want to be on the team, I set up a Google Classroom for them and I assign them work and they they do it um, like on like at school, you know, af after school at home, they're actually doing the work I'm giving them or coming to me for tutoring before or after school or asking for help if they're not playing the game at that time. So they're there. They want to be on the team. They, they have a goal now, which a lot of them didn't have going into this program was you didn't have a goal to be at school or any reason to be at school. And now they do, um, you know, to be with their friends or they have friends for the first time. You know, we have a I have a couple neurodivergent students on the team that have never felt like they're a part of anything and now they have friends and they have a team that supports them and you know, one of our students who went the farthest in the tournament last year, his mom said he'd never been on a team before and she was wasn't sure he'd ever have real friends or be on a team because of his disability and he now has this group of friends that were cheering him on at the tournament and just, you know, loud as can be and just always are supportive of him as he plays every week on the tournament and nobody wants to play him because he's the best at smash brothers. And it's just <laughs> such a cool feeling for that kid. And, and to see, you know, to see the mom really like get like emotional about it was just huge for me because I was like, you know, I'm really making a difference with something. I'm making a difference with a video game. <laughs> how many, you know, how many people can say that a video game has really made a difference in their life. And I get to say that every day that video games make a huge difference. I get paid to hang out and play video games. <laughs> <laughs> for at least you know three hours a day <laughs> that is that that story about that student and about that mom like that is that is powerful like like that one family e even e even if the work and i know this is not the case but even if the work didn't really have that in big of an impact on anyone else but it did for that family that is that is huge and you should be really proud of yourself for Thank for you. for facilitating that um, for, for them. That's, that's amazing. I, I often hear, well, I often think that sometimes people, leaders, teachers, like, you know, educators like yourself are like, cool. It would be, it would be great to have like an esports program or, or have some, some sort of outlet for, 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 for students like this. Um, oftentimes, you know, money funding, uh, infrastructures is, is an issue. Uh, do you have any, suggestions pro tips of like how to get started with something like yeah. this whether maybe it's the plot starting at the classroom level school site or even district level definitely uh, my suggestion is to start small start with one console start with minecraft on a desktop start with minecraft on a chromebook or on an ipad you don't have to play like the big name video games you can start with minecraft you can start with fortnite creative it's free through epic you can start with one console and one game and two controllers and a monitor. You can have a teacher bring their Xbox every Wednesday and let you borrow it. <laughs> you know, you don't have to purchase one for school. Like one of your male teachers at school or female teachers has a kid at home that has an Xbox or a PS5 and they're not using it during the day. So maybe borrow it, take good care of it. Um, buy them refurbished on Amazon. 
um, just start small as the key. Cause even if you just start with one, you're that's still more than nothing. Most of my kids every day are gathered around the PS five playing Madden and I have three other consoles sitting there, but um, so just starting with one is fine. Nothing is too small to start with is what I'm saying. Um, and just build from there. If you want funding, tie it into STEM with a program like Elite Gaming Live or some of the other ones out there. Um, the National Esports Foundation has a curriculum online that's free to download um, and you can tie it into STEM. So you could use Title I or ESSER funding. You can use your CARES Act funding if you have anything left. Um, that's some places to get money if you're looking for it right now. Um, and then there's other organizations that offer scholarships for schools to start. So just you know, doing your research out there, looking, Googling esports scholarships, pilot programs, those kinds of things. And starting small or starting with maybe one or two consoles, it would be my suggestion. Um, my principal is a very visionary leader and saw the difference it was making and is investing a lot of money right now into creating the like top of the line esports lounge in our lab. And we're going to run like four PS5s and three Xboxes and four Switches. And we're going to have wall mounted panels and gaming desktops and stuff like that with really cool furniture. And that's, you know, what she decided to, she's putting the money where the difference is being made, where the data showing there's a difference. And I'm very thankful for that. I think I'm going to like cancel my lease and just live in my esports lounge. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> Cause it's going to be that cool. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that, but um, yeah, so just, you know, start small and build, you know, there's no, like, there's no way that it's too small to start. And like I said, I'm, I always like louder for the people in the back. You don't have to be a gamer to do this. I don't game. I don't play Madden or any of those like really intense games. I might get on and play Mario Kart every once in a while. And I'm a really sore loser. So it's like, I act like Dale Earnhardt, like, come on, like, bring it at me. Like, you got to really like try hard. <laughs> but um, I, I will get down and play with the kids too. Like, they love it. Like, I even invite the teachers in at lunch or after school, like, come and play with the kids. They would love to beat you at a game or like, see, have you. <laughs> So, and then um, I also let the teachers rent me out for Fun Friday. They can like reserve the lab for Fun Friday if their kids or like earn an award, like or get like a reward for classroom behavior or passing a test or whatever the thing may be. They can rent space to come and let them play and game. And some of my teachers do that. Our eighth graders have a big tournament that ties into their um, eighth grade decathlon at the end of the year that I run for them. So, you know, just using it whenever you can is the just start small and do it. You can do it. Anybody can. Yeah. I can do it. Anybody yeah. can. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's awesome. And that's super encouraging, right? Like um, that, like just everything you said, everything you stated, like whether it's like finding funding where it's at um, scholarships, uh, stuff, stuff of that nature. It kind of reminded me not to like go on a different tangent, but it kind of reminded me of like back in the day we had a uh, blockbuster right where you can go rent like if you didn't have like you know if you didn't have a playstation or a sega genesis like you can just go you can go rent it um yeah and, and, and so too bad we don't have things like that but yeah thank you for sharing your uh your insight on that and, and your experiences um because i think a, a lot of people out there um appreciate that and, and and will benefit from from that knowledge um yeah and a lot but, of the gaming stores like gamestop and some of those stores that are still around sell old consoles oh. pawn shops are a great place to get them Oh yeah, that's um, true. If you want to get like real like grassroots about like bootstraps, like go to a pawn shop. There's probably a PS5 there that's gonna be cheaper than on Amazon. Um, you know, Best Buy has mm. refurbished stuff. Like a lot of companies do refurbished products, so those are a great place to start because right. the kids are playing it. As long as it works, that they, they don't care if it's brand new or used. Yeah, I think I've turned one in over the last few years, like at a GameStop, right? Like yeah. that's that that's that's a really good point. Um, awesome, awesome. Well. Renee, I know that you have more tea, more excitement to share. Um, so what's the other thing? Tell us. Okay. So as lots of people who are on X or socials know, Jamboard is sunsetting into the <clears throat> offline era. And there's a really cool company that's kind of been pushing to replace Jamboard because I was a big Jamboard user during the my last year in the classroom, which was the year of COVID, the virtual year. I used Jamboard constantly with my students because it was a great tool and it was really just personalizable. You could put whatever you wanted to do on there and have the kids interact in real time. Well, Figma has a platform, FigJam, that they're using in education as an online whiteboard. Um, if you've used like Canva's online whiteboard or uh, Miro, it's similar to that. 
but they have gotten a group of 10 or so rock star educators together, including myself, to build out some education templates to offer for free to the education community. And it's templates from every, for all kinds of things. I just did two that are exit tickets. One of them, um, I have a strange sense of humor and I really like being punny. Um, I called it Come At Me Bro, and it's an X-based um, template where the kids get to, in 170 characters or less, summarize their lesson and then create a, an X handle that is related to the lesson that they just learned. And it's you know interactive. They can upvote each other's responses or and comment on it and share what they want to share um, in real time with each other on this um, platform. So look on X and different social media platforms because we just went live today with the announcement of who we are and what we're doing. We're the inaugural cohort of edu creators for Figma for Fig Jam, and um, they're going to be sharing our templates um, pretty much starting now. And we're going to be sharing out what we're creating and they're going to share them daily and weekly as we create. That's and cool. And, and 10, so we should have a hundred when we're done. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Like I, I, I just, I just really appreciate that various different companies um, like Figma, right. Are, are, are getting, are getting educators like yourself involved. Right. And, 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 and giving that opportunity because it, it looks like you're in a place where, you are getting different opportunities, right? Because of your talents, because of your experiences. Um, and so that's, that's awesome and, and amazing. Um, and, and so as you, as you continue on that journey, uh, I'd be curious to hear more about it as it progresses, uh, maybe have you back in season two or yeah. hopefully a season three. Right. Um, so that's, that's super exciting. Um, we're, we're at the point though, of you know into the show where we this really the one question show right um even though i i end up asking a bunch of questions uh <laughs> but so we, we we talked about you know we just got done talking about your, your your work with figma uh we got done talking about um you know esports your your experience as a teacher as, as an educator the work that you've done in your district and you've you're seeing a lot i'm sure right in your state and and in your district um but like with all of that in mind, what is at the moment for you, like what is top of mind based on what you're seeing in education? What is under the hat for you? AI. That's my jam. And I'm sure lots of people say that, but I've been on the AI bandwagon from like back when I did assistive technology because it was such a game changer for some of my students who had physical disabilities, um, students that maybe were mm. nonverbal, students that couldn't use their hands and could only use maybe a finger to do things. Um, just having the, those AI components were huge back then, but now with generative AI and the huge impact it's had on education, that's really where my focus has been for a, the past few months. Obviously joining Almanac was part of that, but I found out today that I am a top 20 finalist for Magic School's AI's Educator of the Year Award. So That's right. Um, Yes. So that's really huge because I, there are over a hundred semifinalists and I made the top 20. So that's, you know, I'm flattered and honored and just shocked, but you know, my work, especially with AI for student support has been huge this year on the conference circuit, just getting teachers to understand, like, let it help you with your students. Let it make that student's life a little easier. Let it make your life a little easier. Let it take something off your plate. Work smarter, not harder is what I always tell my teachers mm -hmm. when it comes to AI. Um, so yeah, generative AI has been like on the top of my mind for a while. I love it. I see the drawbacks of it. And definitely we already had a student, <laughs> bless his heart, um, <laughs> to go to chat GP, G GPT and tell it to write a paper on a third grade level with multiple misspellings on a topic <laughs> because he knew well, he wrote it about a third grade level and he couldn't spell well. So he was trying to yeah. get it past the teacher, but it still didn't pass the snuff test <laughs> because it was still way mm. better than he could have written, but he tried, he gave it, he gave it a try. <laughs> so <laughs> he gave it a go. Uh, he gave it a try. I was like, you know, work smarter, yeah. not harder. I get that, but let's at yeah. least maybe let it give you the ideas and then you expand on the ideas. Maybe don't let it write the whole paper for you. Um, right. Let's compromise. <laughs> but he tried. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so how are, um, how are teachers tracking that? Like, I'm just curious, like, like so I always hear like, oh, oh, the cheating part of it, but I don't really hear like 
real accounts, right? So right. How, how is that working out? <laughs> so yeah. the teachers, you can usually tell if a paper has been written by AI when it, a middle schooler turns it in. <laughs> Because they're like, I've had kids when I taught fifth grade, I had a student one year, bless his heart too, that just went on Google and copied like the little first couple of lines that Google gives you of everything that you search and then just paste it in a paper, but it's all different fonts. And like some of it's italicized and, and none of it made any sense. And I was like, what did you, did you just copy like for, straight from Google, like all the sources? And he was like, yeah. And I was like, that doesn't make any sense. Um, so it's usually pretty obvious when they've cheated. But I've been working with my teachers on using tools like Brisk, which is a Chrome extension that'll um, that does sniff out if it's been written by AI for you. Um, especially if you're using Google Docs, you can just open it right there, and it'll tell you in your Google Classroom whether the kid used AI or not. Like it'll try and detect it. It's it's pretty good. Mm -hmm. It's pretty accurate for my teachers anyway. But I usually just try and tell them like just like meet them in the middle and let's start with like maybe let it give them the topic sentence. And then have them expand on the topic sentence or let it give them the first five sentences of a story and then they have to finish it. So you're not like telling them they can't use AI, but you're showing them how to use it responsibly and you're showing them how to use it to build upon an idea that maybe they need that jump start to get to get something written because written expression is hard for kids, especially post COVID. We're seeing so many gaps in writing and reading and, you know, just they're going to use it. They're going to use it. So have them use it, but have them use it responsibly. Have them use it in a way that you're cool with, that you're okay with meeting them in the middle with. And that's kind of where my teachers are. My teachers are really great because I come up with these wild ideas and they're like, yeah, cool. Okay, let's do it. So <laughs> I'm just really blessed to have a staff that, that does that for me and lets me just come in and say, hey, let's do this and let's try it this way. And they're like, okay, what's the harm? Let's try it. If it doesn't work, then we'll go back. Sure. So that's kind yeah. of where we are right now. Well, in yeah, my mind. I, I was, yeah, right. And so, like, again, I've been, I, I've been out of the high school classrooms coming up on two years. And for me, like the writing part of it, there's a whole lot of writing in in my in all of my classes. And for me, it was more about like in the room. Let's learn the process of how to construct the paper. And it did, it did make it to where there was less cheating, right? Like because they're like, oh we're all in this together and mm -hmm. do and doing things in a way that's also collaborative, like that peer to peer feedback mm -hmm. um, and like working through the outline part of it, intro paragraph, all that, all that stuff at the time though, you know, there was cheating in the sense of like, Oh, I'm, uh, I'm going to take the paper from his fifth period student and I'm going to try, you know, so, um, but at the time I did have a uh, turn it in. I don't know if, you, if you've used that. Yeah. Um, I don't know if turn it turn it in has I've heard nothing about updates from them. So like I don't know if I it is catching it AI. AI component already. I believe okay. so. Okay. We don't I don't okay. we're in a middle school, so we don't have it, but from what I think what I've seen online, they do have something. Um okay. but and I've like with my students, you know, um Microsoft just did their reimagine education seminar like yesterday, I think. And they talked about Copilot being expanded. And I'm excited about that for my students because Copilot at the very bottom shows you the resources right away of where it pulled the information right. from. So I've been, I'm hoping to be able to show my teachers like this is a great thing to use because it's giving the kids their sources and then they can judge whether it's accurate information or not, if they're using it to write their outline or at least get information towards research for a paper. So hopefully yeah. things like that will keep popping up that'll make teachers more comfortable using it. And then, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a judgment call. And a lot of districts, you know, are blocking it totally right now. And I just feel like that's so, that's, that's tough because, you know, if you want your kids to be like global citizens, really ready for the world and careers, like AI is going to be part of their life. It could be their job. It could be part of their job. You know, like I just um, saw a bunch of stuff on being getting certified as an AI prompt writer, you know, stuff like that. Like that's, mm. who would have thought that that would be a job? Like, like I talk about like being a community manager, or, you know, the kind of the stuff that you do for Cami. like in high school, did you think that you'd have a job doing something so cool? You know, like when you think about being a teacher, then you think about like managing a social community or being a social media manager. That was not. A when I was in high school, just to be fair, when I was in high school, I was this kind of kid. I was like, I, I was, I was questioning whether or not I was going to have a job. Um, <laughs> <laughs> more or less like like do do what i'm doing now right um yeah no that so 
because if you don't mind, let's go back. Well, really yes, quick. back up, yeah. Because you mentioned Copilot. Yeah. And so my understanding, that, that's that's the Microsoft. That's logo, the Microsoft one. All of that. And so I recently started playing with that. Uh, I was preparing for um, a PD that I was going to deliver um, with Cami, right? But like uh, what I found interesting about it is that like that thing can mash up to anything because it's web-based. So I was on accident, I was like, playing in cami in microsoft edge and if you hover like you'll be you know in cami you'll be doing things like with the dictionary tool and that and that's and that's cool but like and then the little microsoft icon popped up and then copilot was just there i'm like wait i have copilot and cami all in the same like in the same environment on the same document and i was like ooh, this and that's what i think is cool about what microsoft is doing is like that thing can go on top of any platform if I'm understanding it correctly. Mm -hmm. And I actually, on my iPhone, uh, one of my one of my friends uh, that I know through my HP fellowship, Nick Shiner, he showed me how to make my side button on my iPhone co-pilot. So when I hit my side button now, co-pilot comes up on my phone, on my iPhone. Wow, that's, that's pretty cool. That's yeah. pretty cool. I, yeah. And then in terms of like the cheating component of it and, Renee, correct me if I'm wrong, I, or may, maybe you, maybe you disagree. But like, what's the difference between a student cheating from AI versus cheating from another student? It's the right. Same. Like, I mean, at the end of the day, it's the same it thing. Right. I feel like I feel like it's the. I guess the one the one difference is it, it's a lot faster to do. Right. And cheaper. <laughs> you don't have to pay. Um, what are those the the professors that 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 website, the collegeprofessors.com or whatever it is to write your paper. Right. Right. I just, yeah. I had a high school student one time turn it in, like forward me an email with the paper attached and it still had like the un unpaid professors or whatever that company is. It's like the, the email that they sent him, he just forwarded straight to me with the paper attached. Didn't even like take, take that part off. And I was like, bro, really bro. Like you gotta try at least to hide it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. And then, I mean, cause Sophie, Sophie has a good point too, is like, what kind of trust are we building yeah. in, in our classrooms with our students? Right. Like that, that to me always like was so important from day one, right? Like we start mm -hmm. the school year, like they know yeah, me, I know them. Trust and respect um, is like key. Like if you don't have that in your classroom, what's the point? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then I, I, I know that the other night on the show, we had talked about like uh, with Michelle Manning uh, talked about, you know, um, alternate assessments, like, you know, or alternative assessments of like, you know, it doesn't have to be an essay every time. Right. No. And if it's, if, if, if it's that easy to cheat for everything that you do in your classroom, then my thing is like, well, are we asking, what are we asking of our students? Right. Like, what is the task? What is the question? Right. Is the question the back of the book or is it something that is real world? Is it something that's authentic, right. that involves problem solving, critical thinking, that, that sort of thing? Like, make your assessment something they don't want to cheat on. Like, I quit giving traditional assessments mm -hmm. years ago and I started ma letting them make me rap videos, TikToks, collages. I have, I had one thing that they could do called teach the teacher where they had to find something on that topic that I didn't teach them and teach me about it. And they used to love to try and teach me something I didn't know, like see if I didn't know it already. That was one of the favorites, but like, no, like how are you going to cheat on a rap? And if you write a rap, if you think about it as student composing lyrics for a rap song, that is so much more than just regurgitating information on an assessment or writing an essay, because they're actually having to think through the concept and make alliterations to it, make analogies, make, figurative language that goes with it to make, to create an actual hip hop or rap song that it's showing that they actually understand the content better than if you give them a multiple choice test and they're having more yeah. fun and they're more likely to do it. They're less stressed out. Their parents are less stressed out. They understand the content better. So why not make it more fun? Like I'd much rather listen to five kids rap in front of my classroom than grade 10 assessments. <laughs> or oh, okay okay or oh my gosh you're you're, you're taking me back to when when, when i first started because I, I i had this um project if you will that i got from my cooperating teacher when i was student teaching and it was a fine project it was good it was really inquiry research based right um but like they had to like you know teaching civics they had to um give a report card 
they had a grade of former president based off criteria, right? Based right. off like their economic policy, foreign policy, like all, um, you know, all that good stuff. And, but, uh, but what it, what it, what it was though, is they had to then had to present it in front of the class. So, which was fine, except <laughs> I remember like the first time that I did it solo, like my, with my own students, I'm like, wait, I have to listen to this all day. Like listen to bad presentations, even though I told them like, don't present in this way. Like right. don't read every word on the slide. Right. And what do they do? They go up there, they, they read they every word. They don't even fake like it's like they they break every like public speaking rule that there is right, um, but eventually I was like wait a second why 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 am I doing it that way why aren't they building a podcast on it or why aren't they curating um, a silent movie or a documentary or yep. and, or maybe like doing something that is they're presenting it to a different group of students mm -hmm. at a different school site or in a different state let's say right um and because yeah like a, a, a lot of times when people like look at like what's innovative they're like oh i can't start all over i'm like you don't have to start all over just think differently about the things that you're already doing right or like like what are the students into and let that drive how you assess them like this right. is the TikTok generation. If it's not under two minutes, they don't want it. So <laughs> make it something under two minutes. Give them a, like I have a social studies teacher that I worked with last year that we did a 60 second documentary. Every student, the classes broke up into groups and made 60 second documentaries every unit on a different topic from the social studies unit. So then if you think about it at the end of the year, when you're reviewing for the state test, you have like 50 videos of the entire year in one minute chunks going over different content. So we lay and the kids were so cool about it because they just like loved watching their progress with editing and being be, becoming better script writers and movie makers that we ended up doing like a faux Oscars at the end of the year where they got to vote on each other and like dress up and walk down the red carpet and do like a big we did a big thing. And at, at the end of the day, they watched all these videos again and they reviewed for the statewide assessment. So, and, but they didn't think they were reviewing. They thought they were just judging videos and that they made throughout the year. And so stuff like that, like you're going to have buy-in, you're going to have engagement, you're going to have smarter kids, happier kids, happier parents. Yeah. Where, yeah. And say? that's, <laughs> and that's the, and that's the best type of learning when they don't even know that they are learning. No, you tricked like, them into learning. <laughs> you tricked them into learning. Like yep. you can buy uh, a selfie ring light stand for $25 on Amazon and get like a green sheet mm -hmm. for like $10 and download some apps and you're good to go with a movie studio because the kids will know how to use everything. Don't worry about it. You know right. how to, you don't have to know how to use it. The kids will figure it out before you learn how to and just give them the iPad and let them go. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I always hear, uh, you know, just in what I do now, like training teachers and, you know, the professional development side of things. Um, what I hear a lot is like, Oh, it's another tool to learn. I was like, just give it to the students. They'll figure it out. You'll learn right. with them. And, and they now. might, Huh? All right, you ready? This is today, every day. You have to think, I always think about it this way. Every day is the best technology my teachers have ever used and the worst technology my students will ever use. <laughs> right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's very true. That's very true. And and yeah, that's, that's, that's what I kind of conveyed to them. I was like, and because sometimes I, I go into, like uh, whether it's online or in person or a conference and I'm like, you know, your students are already using our tool, right? They're, they're, they're already using it. Make a village. You're in a classroom, yeah. like, you know, and figure it out together. Um, and those talks normally go really well, right? Like, like it, it is, it is possible. It is obtainable. It's not like, you know, with a lot of these tools, you know, you know, a tool at the very least, everyone knows one and you'll be surprised that that's how that skill applies to other areas, other tools, other platforms um which i really appreciate um yeah. with what i do now what we do is um i do tech playgrounds and i do like four tools at a time but i let mm. my student tech team come in and lead the tools so the teachers get to sit and experience the tool as a student so it kind of flips the script because if they yep. experience it as, as a student and see how engaging it is they're more likely to want to use it in the classroom 
And then it gives my students those skills, those, pre those presentation skills that aren't reading off a slide deck because that's not one of the options that you have. I don't give you a projector. You don't have a slide deck to read off of. You have to, you have to teach a lesson to these teachers with this tool. So now you're getting comfortable teaching in front of people and speaking in front of people without that crutch of a presentation behind you. So it gives them like a, a whole new shake on life because <laughs> they get real nervous about it the first couple of times. But then the teachers love getting to be kids for a few minutes and playing Gim Kit or playing on Cami or you know using this AI tool and just being able to soak it up and say, okay, cool. I want you to come in my classroom and help me with this now. So then I get more coaching done because they're more likely to say, mm -hmm. come in and do this because the kids, yeah. I really liked it. And I know if I like it, the kids will like it. So And again, going back to it, because we're all human, right? building that trust as yep. Sophie mentioned earlier, right? Building that, that, that relationship, that, that rapport with them. Um, and, and so, you know, to me, that was, that's, that's part of it when we're not just talking about students, but we're also talking about, you know, getting teachers on board, getting them to feel oh, yeah. confident and comfortable with the things that, um, you know, that you're trying to get them to do. Uh, and which I'll admit, I, think like, I did it phenomenal. wrong my first two years. I just, through tech tool after tech tool after tech tool at these poor teachers every other week. And I realized yeah. this year, like, that's not, I can't, that's not fair to anybody. Nobody can master something if they don't have time to practice. So I changed it up and I do one tool a month. And then the rest of the month I'm there for coaching and open lab time for them to come in and play with the tool, ask me questions, help, let me help them plan a lesson, go into their classroom model and co-teach all that stuff. And I have teachers using stuff with more, um, fidelity now and like being more engaged, even themselves implementing the tool because I'm not overwhelming them with every single tech tool out there. Cause that's cool with me. I can, I love that. Like I love learning a new tech tool every day, but that's not natural to most human beings. <laughs> and I realize that now. <laughs> no, and no, that was a realization for me too. I was just like, wait, not, not everyone likes playing the way that I like to play. Right. right. Um, I, what I love doing, because earlier you mentioned like putting the teacher's in the seat of the student right um what i love when when i do that when because that's basically any like session that that i give i, I give them that experience like, like you're talking about is showing them the classroom management stuff of some of these tools it's like oh i took all the tools away from you and they're like yeah. no and, and and so getting them to like showing them how effective it is what it feels like on their end um and that also brings up kind of different situations of how you personalize things right like like the yep. classroom management stuff it's not just for the behavioral stuff it's also for managing an environment that is inclusive that makes sense for various different students right and for various exactly. different needs yeah um love it renee this has been super fun has um, been. i hope you've had fun yeah i yeah i i hope we do this again uh this, this shows anytime. open door yeah, this show is yeah. super open door uh, for anyone within reason to be on. Um, and, and and so um, thank you for sharing everything that you shared tonight. I, I, you, you, like we mentioned at the very beginning, you wear many different hats for the people that you serve. Um, and, and as a result, you have different insights, different skill sets, right? Like you're not like, like sometimes for me, he's like, oh, Steve's the project-based learning dude. Um, and so like you, you have like this wide spectrum, like these, like these different um, experiences that, that, that you have to share with people. So we really appreciate it. Okay, I um, appreciate you letting me share. And yeah, <laughs> all the tea. Yeah. And yeah, I appreciate all the tea and congrats on all that, by the way, I, you. I, you know, like, like any time that has and continues to happen to me, I celebrate whether it's with my family and with friends. Um, and, and so just congrats on that. Thank you. If anybody has follow-up questions or maybe wants to reach out to you for support, where can they find you? What's the best place? Hit me up on X at APS ITS Dawson. That'd be that one right that there. That is friends. where I, yeah, that's where I'm, that's, I'm always constantly on there sharing the good, the good stuff too. So look, you know, follow, give me a follow. I'll follow you back and uh, we can chat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I just, so everyone knows like, so Renee, just by experience, like seeing, seeing Renee online, super accessible. Right. And, and so kind of what she just alluded to right now, but like you follow her, she will follow back. You hit a DM, you'll hear back. So uh, please reach out. I try to do the same, right? Um, I'm, I'm, we're not trying to be these people that are somewhere in the 
no. in the interwebs. Uh, we're, we're super accessible. Um, and as far as me, uh, feel free to continue to you know reach out on under the hat pod that's what that's the twitter goodness if you want to go to the website itself underhatpod.com that's where you'll find all the links the social links that's where you can catch all the episodes um and and uh if you if you do want to be a guest please hit me up at under uh, underhatpod underhatpod.com um and we'll be sure to get you on really appreciate all of you and continue that support continue the follows the likes all that fun stuff um i'm here for it i'm here to learn with you and to have a good time and friends we it's it's five o'clock my time so it is time to get going with the family enjoy my time there you all enjoy the rest of your evening and the rest of your thursday possibly friday depending on where you are in the world and as always friends keep your hats on but your minds open and we'll see you next time thank you bye